Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the afternoon session of the first day of the conference workshop. And uh, I would like to present myself. Uh, my name is Lena Halunova, and I'm a professor at the Department of Geometrics of this faculty. I'm chairing this session, and uh, there are four speakers. This is half Czech presentation, half international one. I would like to ask speakers to take in mind that they have 15 minutes for their presentation, and then uh, there is a five minutes reserve for question and answers. So the first speaker is Francis Matthews, and he's going to speak about utilizing Sentinel two time series data at the field parse, parse scale to identify, sorry, the temporal risk of soil erosion in the European agricultural landscapes. So please, the floor is yours. Apologies for the long battle. I'll try. <laughs> no, it. I, I have it destroyed a little bit. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I'll try it again. Yeah. So, hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks for being here. To say the title again is Utilizing Sentinel 2 Time Series Data at the Field Parcel Scale and to Identify the Temporal Risk of Soil Erosion in European Landscapes. Um, and I am a collaborative doctoral partnership, um, doctoral student, PhD student between uh, KU Leuven University and the Joint Research Center. So today at most, uh, I hope you can learn about how we can use Sentinel-2 time series to start understanding uh, the time risk of soil erosion processes. Um, at least I hope, at least um, you can under understand a bit more about soil erosion as, a, as an environmental process. Um, so quick background. Um, so what, what is soil erosion? Um, I mean, well, so to put it simply, it's the removal of soil from its place where it should be, which is, you know, bringing fertility and providing, say, a, a bucket of nutrients for crop growth in European agricultural lands. And it's removing it to places where it shouldn't necessarily be. Um, and we have continental scale evaluations of, of soil erosion. Um, and these have helped put soil erosion on the map as an environmental problem um, and evaluate where attention should be should be drawn to in Europe. Um, and from these we can say we have big figures about the kind of extent of European agricultural lands affected by soil erosion. And this we have this figure at something like 13% of soils in Europe suffer from well severe, high severe soil erosion. Um, and this has many economic consequences that come come along with it. These are put, put at 1.25 billion euros per year. Um, and we also know that climate change will increase the pressure on this process um, and the situation will get worse in the future. But coming back to the present, uh, how can we address these problems? And my work focuses on a, a new spatial and, spatial and temporal perspective on soil erosion uh, with a focus on the integration of modern data. Um, so firstly, a new spatial perspective. Well, Things happen, management happens at the, the field parcel scale. Um, so taking this scale into account, uh, we use the uh, data sets that become available recently um, over the last few years. Some are already open. There's more of a push to release these. And it comes from the integrated administration control system, otherwise IAX data. And what it contains is vectorized descriptions of field parcels. Um, and these also have declarations of crops that are being grown by farmers. Um, and what this allows us to do is look at the landscape in terms of units of spatial similarity. Um, and it also provides a management relevant spatial scale to look at problems and start associating models with the real world. Um, and in terms of the soil erosion modeling frontiers that we have, um, first of all, we have an accurate description of arable land extent, which wasn't always achievable through land cover products. Um, we can also have an object-based prediction of the, the specific risk that the field parcel has. Um, and we can also start to address how the landscape is connected, so how field parcels are related to other field parcels and river systems. Um, and to do this, next we can start associating dynamic properties. So instead of just having a singular descriptive lumped description of an of a agricultural parcel, um, 
we can we can move towards temporally variable. We can start integrating time series and look at how things change the present. Um, because in reality, the properties of a field parcel are in fact both static, things like slope and gradient, for example, but they're also dynamic. There's crop cover, tillage practices, all these agricultural practices that are involved in the management of land. These all change through time and they change the susceptibility of, 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 the, of the field parcel, of the landscape. Um, but normally, traditionally, for somebody to understand this, they would have to go into the field and take many you know, observations and start to match observations with what's actually happening in the world. Um, but since the advent of Sentinel-2, for example, we now have scalable solutions to start monitoring these things um, and start to come to risk indices and start to describe the processes better. Um, so the object objectives of this work Firstly, to develop an object-based method for associating a relative risk with field parcel objects. Um, and then the second part is to add the time perspective, to say what are the temporal windows, the time windows, when a field parcel can be most susceptible to rainfall and soil erosion. Um, and also to evidence how IAX data, these field parcel vectors, provide new opportunities to have multi-scale perspectives of, of this risk. So briefly, the workflow that we implemented here. So what we do is we have this homogenized repository of field parcel data. Um, and this comes from different member states in Europe. And we work to homogenize this to a common nomenclature so it can be intercompared. At the moment, much of this data comes in the member state languages and it needs to be translated and put into a, a common system. Um, and what we do is take them for this, for the creation of this method, we take a subsample. Of, these, of this homogenized data set, and we evidence how this method can be applied on both field parcels and also um, at the comparing region, regions in Europe. What I should also mention is currently we don't have the full um, member state coverage. Um, it's being pushed to have more and more data. Um, and then secondly, we associate, well, the Sentinel-2 acquisitions with each, with each field parcel. And we can also associate a crop declaration and we can see how the crop has grown through time. And we do this using a mixture of uh, satellite series, satellite acquisitions and then gap filling, outlier dismissal, typical processes in time series remote sensing. Um, and then with this data, we can also train a model based on Lucas survey observations. Um, 2018 Lucas observations have declaration of whether there was crop residue on a, a field surface or not. And then this crop residue allows us to evaluate what kind of management practices a farmer had in place during a specific period of time. So when the vegetation was cleared from the land, um, were crop residues left on this field? Um, and this is a, some sort of a proxy for the you know, a reduced tillage process and also if, to say if a field was more protected or not. And to do this, we use a time, we call it a time critical feature ex extraction. So spectral indices, so normalized difference of vegetation index, and also normalized difference tillage index, which are sensitive spectral indices. They're taken at specific time periods um, for each field parcel during the, let's say the harvest period of when a field parcel is clear of vegetation. And then we can also associate rain period characteristics with each field parcel. So based on the data sets we have available through the Joint Research Center, um, through SDAC, we can associate a rainfall, we can call it a rainfall erosivity regime, which is like describing how intense the rainfall is at a certain time period. And then we can start to combine this information together. Uh, quick mention of the data sets utilized, I think I've already mentioned, There's, for example, IAX Sentinel-2, the Lucas 2018, part of the harmonized version. Um, we have open land map. Um, also nuts to regional evaluations of the survey-based approximations of tillage. Um, and then also rain, rainfall erosivity information through the JRC through SDAC. Um, and then to come to the first part, which is an evaluation of you know, the parcel specific risk. So what this allows us to do is to attribute a specific time series to a specific parcel. Um, and if we do this, we can start to see common factors. Um, and what we also see is that 
timing is a very critical component. And when you compare with field surveys that are done in individual places, you can see these, um, you can see these characteristics for typical crop. Um, and what we see is, for example, if heavy storms happen before or after um, the a period of high vegetation cover, you have more susceptibility to erosion. So what we can say is that timing is critical. Um, and we can also start to integrate this kind of information into more composite index of, of soil health risk um, in field parcels. And this also gives some kind of baseline information for <laughs> the recommendation of mitigation. How should a farmer, how should a, what management practices should a farmer use to, to, re to reduce soil erosion at specific time periods? Um, and then the second part we have is the upscaling. So we have all of these field parcels, we have a common method. Um, then we go to an upscaling. So we can upscale the continental scale, well, the cons or the coverage that we have of IAX data parcels. Um, and then we can start to look at regional trends. Um, also having IAX data and doing a feature reduction to reduce the dimensionality also really would then reduces the data and computational demand of this, this process. And then we can look across um, across climatic regimes to see how this changes between climates. Um, so when we do this, we can identify broad periods of time um, where the risk is higher. And you can see there's a lot, quite a lot of information here. But for example, in Mediterranean climate regimes, that the period of susceptibility tends to be longer. It extends into the winter, for example, or the autumn. Um, whereas in some other more Atlantic climate regimes, the, the time concentration tends to, be, tends to be shorter. But what this allows us to do is give a data-driven perspective, and it allows us to provide regionalized um, approximations of when are the risk periods and when should, when should erosion mitigation practices be you know, most targeted. Um, Okay, so I will come to the last point, which is this allows us to, in terms of soil erosion modeling, where we typically would used to um, ascribe, for example, if you have a land cover class, you would typically give a value to this land cover class based on some studies somewhere else. Um, what this allows us to do is use data driven methods to start parameterizing models, um, which is quite a frontier in terms of modeling. In, so in the soil erosion world. Um, and what we can see is that the, the C factor, which is this integrated factor that's used in modeling, and basically it says the relative susceptibility of, of a certain crop. Um, so how much environmental damage do soil erosion does a, a can of crop cause? Um, it says that this is different between, between both crops, but it also varies between regions in Europe. And, since we've in the past been using singular values, we can say that using these new data driven approaches with new methods really allows us new opportunities to start parameterizing models and improving our predictions. Um, so brief, brief conclusions. I'm going to say, say that earth observation data can, can help make informative decisions um, in, the sorts, in the context of soil health and conservation. And there are far more opportunities beyond just soil erosion. Um, Sentinel-2 provides a common data source in this, in this project. We've started to unite the, the fields of crop phenology research with soil erosion research. Um, and also it allows multi-scale evaluations between the field parcel and then upscaling to try and find general trends that can be, that can be derived from, from, from the analysis. Um, and then also then time series information can provide new man management relevant insights. Um, especially, especially focus on time period. And this is what spatial temporal data gives us in this context. Um, so thank you. Thank you for listening. And that's, that's everything. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now we have five minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah, Francis, is there any reason you didn't show any uh, farms? I mean, like a spatial map? Ah, so to actually... Be inside the farm. Yeah. 
yeah so the this model just uh, for you know whole polygons how how is the model if the, the model for pixel or for polygons the, you take that what we do is a spatial reduction so the pixels that are inside the polygon are reduced okay. um like a median to take the median pixel and then describe the crop time series over time so yeah each each field parcel then you know has a description in space so we can also... would you like to have it within the like per pixel i mean because some farms are large so you have variability inside i think there are there are benefit there are positives and negatives to both we've done a lot of pixel scale modeling already um i think there are some benefits to having parcel specific um you know we're starting to attribute off attribute risks with a specific field parcel because through this data source that I mentioned, the IAX, um, there are new opportunities for, for farmers to associate other things with the field parcel. So how much fertilizer was put on a field, what managed what other management practices were done. Um, so if you combine these informations together, you come to a much better holistic kind of views. And this is a C factor, you can validate it on the ground. I mean yeah we can yeah. Val validate it based on field observations and there's slightly more to the method but you can always you can also do with remote sensing data you can also do a regional calibration if if there's a a ground-based measurement that exists you can calibrate to that ground-based measurement based on crop information time series and then a set of workflow yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to do a first Please, I would interrupt you. But introduce yourself. Ah, I'm Peter Kachi from Elixuena. <laughs> uh, you've uh, used the precipitation uh, data set and the correlation. Have you thought or seen maybe some correlation with the uh, soil monitor data sets as well? Because uh, we probably offer itself as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good question, actually. Um, so at the moment, what's integrated is this actually is an average. So it's to give an average indication at the moment. The next phase is to integrate actually, re well, dynamic time series of rainfall into this. So you can actually say the exact risk, but also then soil moisture is important indeed. Because if it's very slant products, you don't like soil moisture for every day. So yeah, you yeah. Can it can also go in, especially for describing winter months, the risk in winter months, because it might actually vary if the soil moisture is very high. So yeah. Any other question? Maybe I would like, I would have one. Our colleagues from uh, the university are deeply involved in soil erosion for many years. Yeah. And uh, I would like to know whether you had some local validation data for your model. Uh, yes. So actually, I think maybe, I, could you say the colleagues' names? Maybe I do. Josef Krasa. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we've been working on um, at the JLC is combining together local data sets from across Europe to have a to have some kind of European data set that can be used for more broad scale purposes. So I've also had conversations with them and they're also part of the project in, uh, in providing these yeah local scale validations to also try and yeah go from a local scale to a continental scale in a more yeah yeah refined way. Any other question? If not, I would like to thank you very much. Thank um, you. Wish you good luck in your future research. Thank you. And uh, my pleasure is to invite Tom Hengel, and I would like to read his uh, talk. And it's uh, building a soil data cube at 30 meter resolution for continental Europe for the period 2000 2022 using spatial temporal machine learning. Please, you thank know you. that your is wrong. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, it's a it's a bit a dark room and it's just after lunch, but uh, I'll try to keep your wakes. Um, it's a um, my talk is uh, pretty much related with the uh, I think work of Francis also, and we're just discussing. We just met actually in this uh, workshop, and we're already discussing uh, collaboration. And so good news, we have more data for for you guys. Uh, it's also thanks to Lucas mainly. Um, so within the GeoHarmonizer project, we made this uh, soil data cube. So it's a sole component of the environmental data queue, basically. And there is a medium article, if you want to read, uh, we are writing also paper. So there will be a full-length paper explaining all the methods, but in, in the meantime, you can read the, 
the medium article explaining uh, how you can access data and uh, where you can find meta information and how to convert values, etc. Uh, just a bit more about Open Geo Hub. Um, yeah, we are non for profit uh, data science foundation in Wageningen. Uh, our motto is connect, create, share, repeat. Uh, and yeah, we are 12 plus staff. We're just uh, hiring some new people. Um, and we primarily run on EU funding, uh, Horizon, and we have some uh, international projects together with partners in the US. Our speciality is open data, machine learning, faster, cheaper, more efficient serving of geodata. Um, as you heard, uh, this project now is finishing Open Data Science at you, but we have another project starting just uh, actually this month. Uh, it's a very smooth transition uh, called Operant Monitor. Uh, please uh, keep your radar on that project. It's a relatively large project, 80 participants. Uh, then there's also Soil Petroleum for Global Good, also soil related pro project. We're trying to build up kind of like a GDAL for soil spectroscopy. And there's also Agri Capture Project, which is our uh, sister company and there are metrics involved in. And this one is also uh, focused on soil carbon mapping in 3D. And of course, we have the openlandmap.org. This is our um, base, base project that we uh, continuously maintain and use for global data. Um, so soil data cubes. So soils are relatively uh, becoming more and more important, uh, luckily. They've been ignored in the past, let's say uh, 30 years ago. Uh, but today, uh, people realize also soils could be a, a one of the solutions to global warming uh, because you can uh, sequester uh, uh, CO2 in, uh, in atmosphere. You could uh, increase soil organic carbon in soil basically systematically. Uh, and also there, um, there's more and more concerns also about soils because soils are getting degraded, there's uh, pollution. Um, and uh, also you see there's uh, erosion uh, happening. Um, and for a long time, you know, we build up this static soil maps basically. And this is called digital soil mapping or predictive soil mapping. Uh, but uh, I was in a workshop uh, two years ago and one of the key discoveries of that workshop and focus was that this static data is not, it's not fit anymore for purpose today. Uh, we need uh, we need dynamic data because we need to understand also the changes in soil and some soil properties, you know, they don't change dynamically. For example, soil uh, mineralogy, uh, it's given from the lithology and lithology, you know, it's a slow processes that uh, take forever, but chemical soil properties, they do change. And then some extreme properties that change, like even on a hourly basis, it's like soil moisture, soil temperature. Um, so, uh, so. And uh, with this open data so could we would like to bridge that gap to provide more, uh, more uh, dynamic soil data. This is the soilspectroscopy.org project. Also take a look at that. We are trying to build up easier way for people to measure soil properties so you don't have to pay expensive laboratory analysis. Uh, but also, yes, please take a look at that if you're interested. And uh, before doing this soil data cube for Europe, we, uh, we made the data for Africa, the 30 meter resolution. There's a, a nature scientific report paper also, please take a look at that. And that was the first time we started crunching with larger data sets uh, because the Africa 30 meters is even bigger than Europe, of course. Uh, but it was also still static. And so the logical way forward was to now move from static to doing dynamic modeling. And this is kind of the, the main me methodology in the geoharmonized project is to do ensemble a machine learning space-time frameworks and all the, the land cover, the forest tree species, and now the soil and air quality, they're all based on uh, running this uh, space-time machine learning. So we said, okay, let's try to do it now uh, with soils. And um, thanks to the European Commission and to a uh, European program called Lucas, um, they are just enough data. And now um, there's just enough data so the three repetitions uh, to do a space-time modeling. If you only have a one repetition in time, you, you cannot do. I mean, it's a science fiction to do space-time. If you have two repetitions in time, you could do see some trends, but uh, you know, when you fit a regression line to two points, you will get line going exactly to both points. So your model is, has no uncertainty. It's 100% accurate. So, but when you have like three repetitions, then you can do, you can see some, um, you can do some modeling, regression modeling, and see whether there's some um, connection. 
This is just the same thing just plotted here. Uh, gets a bit complicated. Everybody would like to use Sentinel data for predictive soil mapping, but the Sentinel starts 2016. And, and to be honest with you, we are really interested last, let's say last 40 years, you know, because we would like to understand fairly pixel in Europe, uh, what's happening with soils and with landscape. And uh, now with the, with the Open Data Science CU, we, we are mapping the 22 years, uh, but we are discussing to move, go back in the past up to the 1990s and to get like, let's say 30 to 40 years, uh, but it's not, it's not simple. So we kind of, most of the things I show you now is based actually in Lancet because we, we couldn't use uh, Sentinel, it just covers only the last uh, basically five years. And uh, we spent about one year preparing this uh, uh, data cube, uh, not only Landsat, we also have the Landsat and uh, Nightlight and Modis and this uh, DTM derivative. So we have in climate uh, climate variables, but we, we prepare this data, environmental data cube. And the core, core part of the data cube, about 10 terabytes of data is just the Landsat, um, uh, cloud-free gap field. So this is the raw Landsat, and this is after cleaning you get this full for every pixel we have. We guarantee ninety nine percent of pixels are cloud free and uh, gap filled. And then you get this data cube. It's about 10, 000, uh, 10 terabyte of data. Uh, when you put all the points to do overlay, it will take about two hours uh, in parallel. So we can run, let's say, five hundred threads, and it will still take two hours. So it's a, because it's really large data volume. Uh, and then once we create that overlay we can fit a space-time machine learning. And it's amazingly simple actually, because you finish, you take for example, solar organic carbon, and you have a one model for solar organic carbon for all of Europe space-time at any depth. So you can predict anywhere in space-time cube using the single model. And then see that single model would guarantee you to produce harmonized, uh, well, if you, do a, if you do a proper modeling, then all the predictions will be based on the same model. So you don't have to worry about any need. There's no need to do any harmonization or corrections. Uh, these are the points. We, uh, at the beginning, last year, we made the first version of the maps and we just used Lucas. I wanted to make it simple. And then it got complicated because Lucas 2018 wouldn't come out. Uh, we don't have access to it. And then uh, also the Lucas is only topsoil. And we wanted to do uh, proper 4D. So we have also depths. And then luckily we got a couple of national data sets and now we're contacting all the national organization and it's turning really nicely into a national European um, collaboration, let's say, where they also the countries slowly give us data. We first got the German data. And you know, if you have, if you have Germany, France and Italy, you have, I don't know, 60% of Europe. Uh, so we got the German data and we have also a few other countries who uh, gave us the data. And then we went to, okay, let's make the predictions now in, in 4D. Uh, it's a large data set. Uh, we're doing five soil properties now. We would like to extend to 10 soil properties. We do four depths. We could maybe do six steps. Uh, and we do six periods now, and we would like to add periods. But when you sum up the, the five properties, four depths, six periods, and predictions and uncertainty for every pixel, you get 240 images. One image is 13 billion pixel. So uh, the whole size of the data that you see on the website is one of about one terabyte. Uh, under after compression. Um, and it took us about uh, four days of nonstop computing full capacity, thousand threads. So that's about 80,000 CPU hours. That's the one run to make, produce the soil data cube. Uh, this is our ship is in action. Uh, we can track them. Uh, we use, of course, uh, uh, Linux and uh, open source software, and we implement all the procedures actually in R in Python. Um, and uh, we will also dockerize it so it will be available for people if something happened to us that somebody can maintain it and uh, rerun the prediction. Uh, these are the results. Um, it's, uh, it's better than I expected, but still there's a lot of scatter around the regression line. But most importantly, we don't see any overestimation. This is the result of cross five fold cross validation. Um, so we don't see any special um, over smoothing, except for the soil organic carbon, there seems to be some organic soils with a bit smoothing out the values. Uh, but for the other properties, I think uh, results are uh, comparable to what we got with, uh, for Africa and for also global models. Um, 
this is the uh, result of ensemble machine learning. Usually the random forest pops up as the most significant base learner, but also more simple learner CVGL net uh, often will pop up also as a component for prediction. Um, and when you look at the variable importance, this is bingo. Uh, we see that the Landsat uh, green uh, band, um, green band P50 for the autumn. So for, for Landsat, we have four seasons. And for each season, we have uh, three quantiles and we have eight bands. So there's a lot of Landsat images. So we, we will go with like about 180 a lot of images, then we produce also NDVI and all the vegetation indices. So we're doing it the, the, the naive data science, which just throw a lot of data on one file and hope to find some correlation. But you see NDVI comes lower, lower what comes up is the, the green and the red band in the autumn, uh, P50. So the uh, median, uh, media reflectance in the autumn and they pop up as the most important. Uh, and then this is the predictions carbon space time. Uh, you if we, when you visualize, okay, carbon doesn't change it so much, you know, even in 20 years. So visually, you don't see I know what, what, what the changes is nothing. You really have to zoom in and look at specific farms. And, and so there's only maybe about maybe about two, three percent of pixels, or maybe five percent of pixels have some significant change of, of carbon. But then again, because carbon is so important, you still want to know where this five percent of something changes happening. Uh, this is the soil pH. I'm not zooming in on Netherlands. Um, and you can see we can also overlay Netherlands. We have the also digital cadaster and we can actually pinpoint the farm and we can see which farms are becoming more acid or if there's any problems with any chemical soil properties. Uh, you can look at the, all these uh, things you can uh, uh, see also in the open data science uh, uh, viewer. Um, and you can zoom in and you can play with the overlays and do comparison between different depths. Um, and it's a four day system. So you see how so properties change with, uh, with depth and with time. And the data is fully open. You can download. You can also go to the data stack open data science at you and you just get the address. You get the URL of the file and that's it. Uh, it's like a database. From there, you can program, you don't have to download anything. You just program, you can do spatial overlay, you can do cropping, you can do binding stuff, you can do extra computation calculation. So you don't have to download the one terabyte. So you can just use the cloud of NGOTIF uh, thanks to this uh, stack, uh, stack system. Um, so the limitations, so, you know, we're very enthusiastic, the results are okay. And something I've been preparing maybe for 10 years to do, and so I got really uh, on the end, I felt like oh, finally we get this uh, dynamic source. You know, we've been talking about it. I remember uh, 2016, 2017, I was applying for projects. And now finally we got it and it works. Uh, and it's, I think, the first continent with dynamic soil information. Um, but there are limitations. And I burn out a lot with the point data. Uh, it's a lot of effort to clean up the data, to check everything. Uh, so there's a lot of work there. Luckily, as I said, there's Lucas, and Lucas is kind of its base. Without Lucas, we wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, but even Lucas, it has some harmonization issues, and uh, there's still a lot of work to harmonize the points. Uh, then also there's some, these Lancet images are not perfect. Of course, you have this paradox in your most sensing today that you have more and more these satellite systems now and in the future, and hyperspectral, I don't know. But actually, as a, I will tell you, as a, a soil landscape scientist, I'm interested in the last 40 years. I want to understand what happened with the landscape. Where did things go wrong? And you cannot do that with Sentinel. You need to go to Lancet. Um, and then uh, there's also thing that we didn't have the depth to bedrock. So we can estimate now some uh, volumes, but we don't have a depth to bedrock. And we also use MLR, and we should be using MLR3 spatial. Um, so yes, there's the first uh, first output open soil data cube for Europe. Uh, we will uh, update it in September. Uh, we will optimize further computing and we'll cut down the production cost and we will keep on extending it. And now we're calling all the nations in Europe and there's many people that have the point data, France, England, Switzerland. I know the people, I send them this and I told them, look, help us make better soil data for everyone, it will be open. It's an open resource. It will be transparent. Everybody gains. You know, it just, uh, I think it's going to happen eventually, uh, except for some countries, they make it a bit like a 
military secret source data, but uh, I hope eventually they will contribute. Please follow our Open Earth Monitor uh, project. We have a launch in uh, 19th of July. It's all, also going to be live broadcast, so put it in your calendar, go to earthmonitor.org and register for the workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. We are waiting for questions. Yes. And would the the model just appear into all so all sample sort of books and in the in the model frame validation process? And then also does the model that has the time of year? When the soil sample is taken. Ah. No, we don't use uh, time as a covariate. We don't use it. We don't use it. And we uh, use uh, all of soil samples that we have that have, for example, soil pH or soil carbon. Not everything is like 100%. But at the moment, about 100, 120,000 to 180,000 samples we have. Uh, and, uh, and we don't use the time as a covariate. So, so we only, only overlay in space time. So when you look, for example, the Landsat uh, green band in autumn, you have it in 21 years, right? Or 22 years. So when you take a new point, you say, which point is this? Okay, uh, uh, Lucas 2012, you find uh, this uh, band in 2012 and then you overlay. We could also do a seasonal overlay. If we knew the samples, if they're taken in which season, spring, autumn, summer, I don't know, then we could have overlaid also in a season. And we eventually we took out the winter because winter we really put a lot of effort to get fill and clean the snow and all the problems. But eventually you still have about 20% of pixels and winter time are very difficult. And we eventually decided to take it out because it can make damage. Uh, observed on your result many uh, uh, there is a lot of variation in forested areas, so the be thinking are you filtering in your asset data for vegetation? Because if it's optical data, then it doesn't penetrate the vegetation, so you would get uh, like uh, the top of the uh, or bottom of the atmosphere, but like the top of the vegetation or top of the surface, which are the vegetation. And regarding soil in the forest, I would expect that the variations there would be. The smallest, or is it the smallest? I don't know. No, no, it's an excellent point. The satellite images, you know, Landsat and Sentinel, they don't penetrate through soil. You, they, it's not an image of the soil. We don't build predictive mapping by correlating uh, or understanding reflectances of the images, you know, re regarding to soil. We, you have to understand, this is like a full data cube. So for one pixel, right, we have all the bands, we have a temporal signature, not one reflectance in one day. We have a temporal signature. We have all the um, uh, uh, climate images. We have all the modis images. So we have multiple, multiple data layers. And the, what we discovered that we can find a relationship uh, with soil properties, whether it's in the forest or, or, or like a grassland or managed land, that we can find the relationship with, without mapping that difference between forest and grassland. But so you just said that you are mapping all the bands and got the fancy uh, the time series markers for for all bands over the whole year, which would suggest that you are using also vegetative area and you are interested in soil properties, which would suggest that. In your model, you are taking account the vegetation, which is not the soil. So yes, but if you look at the random forest, it's a decision tree. So if you know that one pixel has a different signature in different bands through different seasons, and then you don't really directly map soil based on one, one band reflectance, but you, you, uh, you map it based on combination of things through time. We call them temporal signatures. Yeah, that right. would be our uh, that would be uh, uh, I know it's a bit, it's a bit, yes, but in, in a decision tree system, you know, you could, I could sketch that for you, but in a decision tree system, when you put all the data for the whole time series, right, then you, you don't really, uh, you don't really say, okay, here's the forest and I have green, so I have a high solar gun carbon. 
It doesn't work like that. If we are the case, then we would have to uh, split it in like every season. Also, we would have like seasons which is spring, uh, summer, autumn, winter, let's say, and autumn, winter, it would be a bit out. So we found like cover and the spring and. Let's do, let's talk. Uh, you have to stop because I think the time is. I running. think uh, okay. I would like to ask you to discuss uh, yes, the yes, break. No, we go, we go. Thank you so much. Okay. So another speaker is Mr. Daniel Gigella. And he is going to speak about using Sentinel-2 data for spatial temporal mosaic of bare soil creation and mapping soil properties using machine learning. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Daniel Gigella, and uh, I will continue the soil issue and issue uh, on uh, mapping soil properties. Uh, specifically using Sentinel-2 uh, data and uh, using uh, uh, mosaic of uh, uh, Me and my colleague, uh, we are from Research Institute for Soil and Water Conservation from Bra from Czech Republic. So uh, I will talk about uh, mapping soil properties uh, only for uh, Czech Republic. And in my presentation, I will talk about, uh, talk about uh, Berso uh, composite creation, uh, and then briefly about uh, uh, using this uh, this composite for soil uh, properties prediction. So uh, let's uh, to introduce uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, traditionally, uh, uh, soil maps are created in forms uh, of uh, analog map or digital maps in form of uh, uh, of polygons, uh, which uh, need a lot of uh, effort of uh, terrain work and uh, and digitizing and so on and these maps are a lot of a uh, lot of shortcomings on the other hand uh, nowadays uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of possibilities to use uh, some new technologies some new data for example remote sensing data or other spectral data some new statistical methods or data driven methods and uh, uh, we can use it uh, for uh, for soil properties mapping uh, and so-called uh, digital soil mapping. Uh, when we use uh, uh, when we use point data uh, with uh, uh, with ground true information about soil properties and a lot of uh, covariates and to make a model for final prediction of, uh, of map. So uh, how remote sensing data uh, can help us? Uh, uh, previously, uh, the use of spectral data has proven as very useful for, for mapping uh, soil properties, uh, especially uh, spectrally active properties like soil organic, organic carbon, clay content, carbonates, or iron oxi oxides. Uh, uh, the, the spectral data has been uh, uh, has been confirmed. Uh, the utilization has been confirmed uh, mainly on uh, laboratory or airborne uh, hyperspectral data. But uh, also it has been shown that uh, also satellite uh, multispectral data can be also uh, used in uh, anyways. Uh, but uh, there are some there are also some challenges, as uh, as Tom said said. Uh, uh, we can uh, we can use uh, remote sensing data on for mapping uh, surface layer uh, of soil and uh, uh, and individual image uh, satellite image we can uh, use only for uh, local local mapping. Why? Uh, because uh, because uh, on every single image there are a, a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, um, crops uh, on the on the on the fields so uh, as we can uh, use uh, so spectral information only from some field uh, we can we can use uh, individual image on, only for some some fields uh, because the vegetation crops and crop residues mask the spectral information uh, of the soil so how to overcome uh, this shortcoming uh, the possibilities is to use uh, time series mosaicing, uh, as we can uh, we can call it bare soil bare soil composite. Uh, in bare soil, uh, in creation of bare soil composite, uh, we need to uh, 
uh, process uh, all time series uh, of, uh, of satellite images. Uh, mask uh, mask cloud for this uh, we use uh, we use combination of uh, S two cloudless algorithm and uh, sync classification uh, layer from Sentinel two data. And the uh, uh, other challenge is uh, is how to uh, how to mask crops and crop residues. Uh, and so uh, for this uh, we. Uh, we use some some treasure holding treasure holding methods. So in this approach, uh, we process uh, uh, all time series uh, of data. We uh, we mask clouds, and uh, then we uh, we mask bare soil, or we identify bare soil using uh, using uh, two thresholds of uh, the, uh, of uh, spectral indices, uh, specifically green uh, green vegetation. Uh, and we uh, we identify by threshold of the uh, normalized uh, difference vegetation index, and for, for crop uh, residues and sensitive vegetation, we use uh, MBR two index uh, normal burn, burn ratio index. Uh, for for final creation uh, of uh, uh, of composites, uh, uh, we distinguish. Uh, bare soil and uh, permanent crops. Uh, for each pixel, uh, uh, that is marked uh, more than five times as bare soil, uh, we use uh, average, uh, average reflectance from occurrence of bare soil. And uh, if uh, these pixels uh, uh, are identified less than five, uh, we said that uh, it's a permanent, uh, permanent vegetation and uh, we can compete with uh, with reflex sense uh, at the time of the highest NDVI. So the result uh, is uh, is bare soil composite for or area of interest. In this case, it's for for Czech, uh, for all Czech Republic. And here I can show you some uh, some detailed examples. For example, here uh, is the example uh, the the image uh, which show. The contrast between uh, some humic chernozemic soils and some lovis so uh, soils uh, in uh, eastern part of uh, Bohemia. Uh, on the next uh, next image, you can see uh, highly eroded uh, eroded soils uh, in the south of Moravia. And the third uh, example, some red colored cambi uh, uh, soils uh, on on pearl carbons uh, in uh, Podkrkonoshi region and it's, it's north northeast of Bohemia. So now uh, switch to the prediction mapping. Uh, uh, yeah, we use uh, this uh, this bare soil composite as uh, one input to the uh, to do prediction mapping. Uh, and as uh, as input data, uh, we also use some some other covariates so like uh, climate covariates. Some legacy, uh, legacy soil maps, uh, and uh, for example, also uh, also coordinates uh, like a buffer buffer distance map. Uh, uh, we we use uh, we used for for the prediction mapping uh, quantile random forest uh, method, so we can uh, we can be able to to produce uh, some final map of uh, of uh, prediction and also the answer uncertainties uh, of prediction and every pixel. Uh, so now it's uh, about uh, the input soil data. Uh, we use uh, two, two basic data sets. And as, as Tom said, uh, we have some dynamic uh, soil properties and uh, and some not so dynamic. So for, uh, for, for these properties, uh, which we can say that it's not so dyna dynamic, uh, we used uh, data from uh, systematic uh, soil survey from from 60s uh, this uh, this uh, database consists about uh, 300 thousands of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of probes or of, or of uh, information uh, of from 300 thousand uh, probes and for uh, for more dynamic uh, soil properties like organic carbon or pH uh, we uh, uh, we used uh, up-to-date uh, database. Uh, 
for for uh, in this database uh, we have uh, less data, but uh, for example, for so organic carbon uh, about uh, about eight thousand uh, points. So uh, here you can see uh, you can see some some metrics uh, of uh, of uh, prediction ability of models, and uh, yeah, we some. Uh, with some uh, exception, uh, we reach uh, good, uh, good results, and we predicted uh, predicted final maps and the maps of uh, prediction confidence interval, uh, on which we can we can assess uh, the the uncertainty on on, on each point. Uh, so this uh, this maps. Uh, are in a resolution 20 meters uh, per pixel and are available for the Czech Republic. And uh, if you want, uh, you can see the results uh, on our uh, geo portal on this, uh, on this uh, address. And uh, some details uh, about methodology you can find in this paper in Katena journal or, or our methodology, but, but sorry, it's uh, only in Czech. Uh, so yeah it's it's all from me thank you for attention and uh, as you can see uh, even though we we use a modern modern method the method of collection of data is the almost the same throughout the history <laughs> thank you thank you very much for interesting presentation and uh, please questions did you do a 3D model, or so it's just a top solid? Uh, no, it's a, it's a separate models, but for different with different depth. Uh, we model three different depths: zero to thirty, thirty to sixty, and sixty to one hundred centimeters. And you started talking about the bare soil spectra. Yeah. But then you map also the ports. Is that true? Uh, no, no, no. We we it's map. Uh, no, uh, okay. agriculture soil. Okay, you can show the yeah. map where the ports are not scattered. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, next uh, one sorry. here. Yeah. yeah. On the corner, yeah, the ports are not scattered. And this R square just for the top soil, it's because you see, I see only one R square to solve block. And you said, uh, yes, there, there is only, only some results. Yeah, you can hear you know, the results for, yeah. for two then. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. for example, for, for pH, we have uh, not enough data for uh, for deeper layers, so so we predicted only only the top soil. Okay. Well, we can read a paper about which spectra indices have you used for inputs? What's the uh, uh, apart from NDVI and we used uh, we used uh, we used original uh, original bands and uh, not uh, not spectral indices. Have you considered using the uh, so adjusted uh, index. I think it's called Sully, and if it actually exists, there's uh, an index actually like for, for well, but even if not the index, there's also a ratio between some bands that are looking down for bare soil. Uh, uh, you mean, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we can we can also use some some spectral indices for for predictions. But we use only only the spectral bands, mm -hmm. and uh, for for uh, thresholding of the uh, of the bare soil, we use uh, only these two two spectral indices, and from our analysis, it's enough for for detection. But yes. but of course yeah. there are there are space uh, for for some improvement. For example, we have planned to to introduce introduce data from Sentinel One data because. Uh, because uh, in this approach, uh, we can deal with uh, the information about soil roughness uh, and, or, or uh, soil moisture, which is also the, some, uh, some properties which affect the, uh, the reflectance of soil. Yeah, but the results are already quite promising given that the Chernozemia uh, or the Alba region is looking fine and the Moravian, the Epanias and the, the soils around the Moravia River. Out in France, so you don't really need to do much more about the price. And which buffer distance do you use to all points? 
Sorry. Which bar participant? Uh, yeah. Uh, I waited this, this question <laughs> because uh, we use uh, uh, we use uh, uh, your idea from one of your paper, and to, uh, we we distinguish uh, the uh, uh, the training data to twenty quantiles, and we use uh, the distance from points to the to the nearest point in the in the quantile. In the, like one time. Okay. Yeah. So we we use uh, we use 20, it's 20 very, layers. It's very dangerous for bar purposes because you can overfit. So you have to be very careful. Yeah. You, uh, yeah. Yeah. We discuss it uh, in in our paper, uh, and this this problem is uh, uh, almost in the location where where are not good covered by by soil samples. Yeah. Participant, I think, in the workshop. In Develop this method called random forest spatial interpolation. It takes the uh, distances of first, second, third, fifth neighbor. And then there's no circular reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the one you do? Uh, no, not yet, but uh, I read about it and yeah, yeah it's a very good idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other question? A point data. Can I have box, please? <laughs> uh, um, it's not a question, though. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I understand that we are on the open open data uh, <laughs> workshop, but it's a little bit hard question for me because uh, uh, our institution policy is uh, not so open, and the, the data the, the, okay, the input sure. data uh, of, of soil is uh, the owner of uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. So in, in Germany, on the same thing, we are not allowed to share the point data. We signed the. Uh, NDA and uh, and it's a nice deal because we help them with their projects and they help us with ours. So we we signed a mutual agreement um, and and they just allow us to do data mining. We don't we're not allowed to distribute the data. Yeah, I think in this way there is no problem. But uh, but yeah, let's the data are not yes. open, unfortunately. No, no, I understand it. It doesn't have to be open, but uh, at least if you could collaborate. That's yeah, it's possible. Okay, thank you. I think it will work. Thank you so much for the presentation. And the last speaker is uh, Ms. Rivka Fognerova, and uh, she is going to speak about changes in the landscape in the Czech Republic of the Czech Republic. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the organizers for inviting Senia to be here at this conference. Uh, as I was listening to all three presentations before, uh, I would like to start with the explanation of the purpose of this presentation, because last year, Senia, Czech Environmental Information Agency, has joined a kind of uh, public event, which is called uh, the Night of Sciences, which uh, is supposed to present to uh, public uh, what we are doing, what they can read from data. And uh, this is why my presentation will probably not be that scientific as the previous ones. Uh, to start with is uh, that the Czech landscape has been formed by history. We've been going through different uh, re uh, political regions, uh, different uh, economic systems, and this all has actually impacted uh, the shape and uh, the structure of the landscapes. If we talk about past decades, uh, I mean the years from 1990 until uh, 2018, which are actually overlapping the mapping of current land cover. So this is uh, where I'm going. We use the Sentinel data, uh, specifically uh, the land uh, service, uh, which has a global component, pan-European component, which is the one we were using. Uh, there's also local component, which we can use for some uh, detailed measuring or uh, analysis, but the uh, foreign land cover is, uh, let's say, the top one. Uh, the main reason is that uh, the data is available free of charge. You know, you go to the Copernicus EU website, uh, you register there, you can download and use the data for uh, what you need. But 
but this is uh, definitely a good aspect. Uh, it has an interesting time series already, so uh, it's repeated or updated every six years, uh, except of the years 1990 and 2000. But also, uh, the time series makes you, uh, you know, a nice presentation of what is actually happening. Uh, these are the uh, tools and software that were used to uh, do the final analysis. So uh, this is foreign land cover on the, uh, the area of the Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Uh, the foreign land cover has actually 44 classes of uh, you know, the fields plots. Uh, only 29 are uh, can be found in the Czech Republic. And for the analysis uh, or for the purpose to be shown to the public, uh, we used or if the data or the classes were generalized into five main ones, the urban areas, agriculture areas, forests and water areas and wetlands, which are actually two categories normally, but as they are so uh, uh small uh we join them together and you see it's only uh it's less than one person of uh, the Czech Republic so let's go to the urban areas what uh what was uh, found and uh what are the trends urban fabric uh, forms actually three quarters of uh, of all the urban areas there are uh, 14 50, almost 15% of industrial and commercial zones and infrastructure, mines, landfills, and construction sites, and green urban areas. These are the parks and uh, the inner, inner green areas in the urban areas. Here you can see the trends. If you want to see the trends, look at the plots, how they're changing. I'll give you a comment later. Uh, so what we, we can see that there's a continual growth of residential area and there's a decrease of mining areas in north uh, northwest of uh, the Czech Republic. This all information is well known to the Czech citizens, uh, but as uh, it's an international conference, I'm giving this uh, overview. Uh, so uh, the changes uh, between 1990 and 2000, uh, you can see the big cities, which is Prague and the uh, Prague in the center and Br Brno down. Uh, that uh, it's the finalization of residential areas. Uh, there was another um, change between 2000 and 2006, and it was a massive growth of industrial areas. And then again, between 2006 and uh, 2012, another continual growth of residential area in the, in the center part of uh, the Czech Republic. This uh, here you can see the continual growth of uh, houses and, and uh, and small municipalities around Prague, where people, uh, Prague citizens are actually moving out from Prague and they're, uh, they're built more and more in the central Bohemia region. And uh, due to, uh, for example, in the north, uh, north part of the Czech Republic, due to decrease of mining, uh, there was the growth of industrial uh, and commercial zones. New zones can be found, like, small ones. Uh, this actually corresponds to building or finalization of the highways that is uh, like not, uh, that is not very progressing. So from time to time you can see something. Uh, you can actually uh, see uh, nicely on these, uh, these pictures and on this data of the surface mines in North Bohemia, specifically this one. So the arrow shows uh, the period from one uh, foreign mapping to another. Uh, the agriculture uh, areas are uh, divided into arable lands, vineyards, fruit trees, uh, like the lands where uh, the fruit is grown, pastures for, uh, for animals or for cutting the grass, complex cultivation patterns and land that is principally occupied by agriculture with significant areas of nature vegetation it means uh, 
former pastures that are uh, now have forest growing on uh, smoothly. Uh, this is again uh, the evolution from 1990 to 2018. Uh, the very original uh, land used for uh, agriculture are the, the two ones uh, marked in red, South Moravia, and then uh, a bit northern from Prague, uh, or Prague around River Labet. It's uh, it's the lowland. Uh, usually uh, the most, uh, the, the richest one for uh, growing something. An interesting fact is that uh, coming from the communism period where everything was possible, you could have found quite a lot of arable land in the mountains as well. Uh, the change between 1990 and 2000 showed uh, changes of uh, agriculture land uh, into uh, the pastures. Uh, this can be observed uh, until the 2018. So uh, this is like a general trend. Uh, there is uh, the, another one trend is growing of uh, pastures in general, and another trend is decrease of arable land in mountains, which is, uh, you know, something that is clear and uh, also a, a small percentage, a percentage of arable land is um, getting, let's say, getting lost due to the growth of the urban areas. Uh, here I would like to show you another, let's say, heritage from past years. Uh, this uh, is something uh, that uh, is being presented for last, let's say, 20 years to when uh, when we speak about erosion, when we speak about uh, how to ro work in fields in the Czech Republic. And uh, you would always see this map comparing uh, the field plots in Austria uh, and in Czech Republic, you, you can still compare the size of the units, which is much, much bigger than the ones uh, at our neighbors, but I have to say that 20 years ago when I was studying uh, here, we had this picture and it was just black and white, but basically the same. Uh, this this is a heritage that uh, doesn't change. Uh, forests, uh, it is important to uh, say, and it's it's a politic thing to say that slow uh, forests are uh, forests are the areas that slow water runoff in the landscape, they protect the soil, uh, they have an effect of cooling the surrounding landscape, this is why uh, they are important. Uh, the, the forests in past, uh, this is also a topic coming uh, from the previous political systems and uh, we're going slowly, very slowly, uh, step by step to uh, have something changed. So coniferous forest, if someone doesn't know, these are the, the trees that, uh, you know, the Christmas trees that without leaves, broad leaves forests are the uh, trees with forests. Uh, com uh, you can see that uh, there's a much smaller percentage of these forests. Mm -hmm. uh, mixed forests are everything together. And the last one is a transitional woodland shrub, which means uh, something that used to be a meadow and now it's uh, going to be a forest. So the trend from 1990 until 2018, uh, you could have found forest, uh, like quite a lot of uh, forest areas uh, on the border. Again, coming from the history, uh, that was a natural zone where no one could have gone because of the border with Austria and uh, with Western Germany, former Western Germany. So uh, it's just forest and forests. Uh, you can see uh, that there is a kind of linkage of uh, losing the arable land, uh, going slowly uh, to be, not, let's say, tra not, not transposed, but I mean like transfer or change to, uh, to the forest areas. This uh, you can see in other parts than uh, in the mountains, more and more uh, of Greenlands. Uh, what I would like to present is uh, are these changes, uh, the, the light green or that looks almost like white is the change from uh, low forests to forests. So something that was grow, uh, that was 
like you know small trees and grass and now it's getting to be to be a forest that was the transition between 1990 uh, and 2000. Uh, you can see this also uh, in the period between 2000, uh, 2000 and 2006. And this, uh, the, the, yellow, um, the yellow plots are uh, very recent deforestation. Uh, in the years 2006 and 2012, uh, that's the effect of Hurricane Kirill first. Uh, and also slowly, step by step, coming the the bark beetle. It's the beetle that uh, eats uh, the trees. The trees come very dry, uh, and they uh, then they fall, and you have um, a disaster in the forest. So, uh, and this is actually continuing. Uh, that you see in, in the in the red circle, you see uh, Yeseniki mountains, and in the red circle with uh, the hyphens, not full a circle, that's an area that is probably going to be that yellow when we have uh, the Corinland cover cycle in two thousand and twenty four. This is something that is actually happening there, and uh, this is something that it can be predict predicted quite well. So that's the Barbie, the Calam Calamity and the Curial Hurricane. Uh, I showed there at the plot that the Curial Hurricane, it's uh, I think 2007, and now you see uh, still 2017, uh, it's, it's a picture of uh, you know, a piece of land, you know, a piece of forest in the Shumara. This is how it uh, still looks there. Uh, this is a small, interesting picture of deforestation in southwest Bohemia. You see the border, uh, and you the pink is the deforestation in 1990 between two, uh, between 1990 and 2000. Uh, on the Czech side and on the German side, it's happening quite, you know, simultaneously. It's it's just there. But then look at the years 2006 and 2012. It looks like that the bark beetle stops at the border and it's only the trees in uh, Shumada and not in Germany. Uh, apparently the explanation is that in Shumada the, there is a simple uh, and, and a unique, um, what do you say? Uh, the, the trees, uh, the trees in Shumava forests are of one uh, style, just the coniferous trees. And uh, in Germany, you have the mixture, which is uh, a forest of uh, the, those trees that are that are a mixture are not affected by the bark beetles. So this is something that uh, is visible and can be shown uh, can be shown just from the current medical data. Coming to the water areas and wetlands, as I showed at the very beginning, that they only cover one percent of uh, all the all the all the area of the Czech Republic. We found out, and uh, it was or has been found out, that the foreign land cover is not a suitable uh, suitable data set to be used because uh, it doesn't show what uh, is needed. There is a national. Zabaget database. It's uh, managed by the Czech Office for uh, Surveying, Mapping, and Cadastre, and it it maps uh, much bigger details. So comparing this and this, foreign land cover doesn't seem to be uh, the right data to use uh, for analyzing wetlands. Uh, same for. Uh, for some other types of areas, this is an example from Salzburg, where on the left side you see the pan-European data set, which is the which is uh, the Corinne land cover, and the local uh, local level of uh, of uh, not the same data set, but this is a new data set made by uh, Austrians, uh, the national level. It is perfect that the Copernicus data or foreign uh, land cover or whatever you call it, it has a, a very useful time series, but uh, you have the purposes where you need more detailed data. And this is uh, what we are going to work on now. Uh, what I said and what I put, or what has been presented can be found in, uh, in a book, which is as, uh, a previous colleague said in Czech, so for, for the Czech speaking uh, 
uh, participants can find it on the website of Senior. And also, uh, here's the link uh, for the freely accessible uh, foreign data land cover uh, data set. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, enjoy the afternoon, enjoy the rest of the conference, and I'm available here for uh, questions. Thank you very much for investing in part of Czech Republic, where you are now. And uh, thanks your questions. Any experience with the uh, arena data from your country? Have you tried looking also at like quantitative parameters to quantify degradation, for example, uh, what's in GPP or just uh, NDVI trends from year to year? Okay, uh, well, I have to say that my colleagues did the analysis and uh, they're not here. So uh, I'm sorry, I probably won't be able to answer this question. So sorry. No, because of, because of the COVID, you will not get to know. <laughs> no, it's but it's just that the colleague should be in the chat. So if he, he heard your question, he might be uh, he might be writing his answer. So, so let's wait. Yeah, uh, yeah let's wait. <laughs> As you can look at the data portal, we have the NDVI trends so the whole Europe, uh -huh. the meter, and you can then compare what you where you discover like lots of reforestation of mm -hmm. the forest, you can see also that we have a negative NDVI over 20 years. Mm -hmm. okay. We could analyze for you also if you just want the last five years. You know, okay. we, could analyze it. we have the whole data too. Perfect. We have a significant problem with the yeah, reforestation, no, no, but that's the really. one. It's amazing how many yeah. areas you, you pretend pixels that we not the whole pixels of people that you just put it on the map so you can see yeah. where which areas. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a really serious yes. Yeah. No more questions? So probably you are looking for the for coffee break. So enjoy coffee the break. coffee okay. break. Thank you. And uh, I think the next session starts at half past three. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Enjoy the coffee break and a half past two. Another speaker is inviting you to come. Thank you. Thank you. So, dear ladies and gen gentlemen, let me start the last uh, session of uh, today. Uh, so, I will present four. Uh, four speakers. So let's start with the first one. So let me introduce uh, Michal Kaczmarzy, who will be speaking about developing solutions for automated processing of Sentinel-1 imagery for monitoring applications. So the floor, the floor is yours. So I will just, uh, I will just switch it to full screen. Hello. Thank you, the Chairman, for the introduction. Just let me know if you can hear me well and see my presentation so that I know that everything works correctly. We can hear you well and it works. Great, thank you. So as was already said, uh, my name is Michal Kaczmarik. Uh, I'm working at the Department of Geoinformatics at Technical University of Ostrava in the Czech Republic. Uh, today I will present work for from a whole team, so I'm just one one member, one piece of a mosaic, and it will be work related to finished project which we were working on a couple last years. It was project funded by European Space Agency. Uh, its main contractor was uh, company C CGI IT Czech Republic. And the main responsibilities of uh, the university of our team was to develop automatic processing change for Sentinel-1 uh, imagery for four specified use cases. Two of them 
were uh, based on intensity or amplitude change detection, and the other ones were dealing with uh, interferometry technique. And my main goal of this talk will be to introduce you the solutions which we develop for individual use cases to say you something about their performance and so on. So let's start. For those of you who are not uh, really familiar with uh, Sentinel-1 uh, mission, there is a pair of satellites uh, with a synthetic aperture uh, radar, Sentinel-1A, Sentinel-1B. One of them is unfortunately uh, not working since last Christmas. All the imagery is, of course, publicly available, typically a few hours after uh, its acquisition. Within the Czech Republic, uh, each area can be said to be uh, acquired from three or four individual independent tracks. The spatial resolution of the data is dependent on the used product in our case, or in the case of our solutions, it's five per 20 uh, meters. Uh, so not to repeat the given information for every solution which will be introduced, uh, I will say something common to, to them. All of them are based on open source software, uh, mainly OST tool and uh, SNAP software developed by ESA. And also uh, with, they are made from our own Python free uh, scripts. Most of the solution need just the Sentinel-1 imagery and information about the area of interest to, to be run. And all of them can be run in two modes. Uh, the first one, it's like a simple one. You choose area of interest uh, time period and just uh, run the solution. The other one is meant for automatic continuous monitoring over the area, given area of interest. So anytime there is a new image, it's being downloaded. Uh, included in the processing process, and the result is provided to, to the user. So uh, I will start uh, with the introduction of the first use case, which in the beginning of the project was more general, like targeting on uh, identification of any kind of change in a zone of, uh, in a protected area of critical infrastructure. So simply speaking in areas where any kind of construction a lot of works is just prohibited uh, by law uh, during the project uh, there was or the use case was mainly focusing on uh, trying to detect a new building construction just from the sentinel one imagery and although you can find in literature some change detection algorithms based on SAR data, which are aiming on urbanization, only few of them really were dealing with detection of individual single buildings. And all of these were uh, focusing or were working with uh, very high resolution data. So, uh, our solution is based on a statistical approach. So we have a stack of images, uh, pre-event one and the post-event one. So you group images over some time period before the construction or any kind of work in which uh, you are interested to detect. And you statistically test if uh, the difference between mean of backscatter intensity and coherence in the pre-event period and post-event period has changed on a pixel uh, level. Uh, afterwards, there are some post-processing steps uh, being done, including fuzzy technique, region growing, and so on, mainly to suppress uh, false positive uh, detections. So unfortunately, we do not have time to go deeply into description of the solution, but we will at least stop for a moment to say something about the performance of the developed solution. So for the validation, we had uh, two testing areas, one in an urban area, Ostrava city, one in a mainly rural area with uh, natural surfaces. We have processed with the solution uh, several years of data uh, for each change which was detected. We were trying to classify on which type of 
surface it was detected and we were also of course assessing the success rates of the real uh, building uh, detections so uh, providing you a summary of these results uh, we can say that when you process just data from one single track you will be able to detect only about 40 percent of uh, new buildings the success rates will be higher for buildings which are larger than standard single family house. And it leads to the result that the spatial resolution of the Sentinel-1 is the main limitation of the detection success. So if we were using uh, with the solution data with high resolution, very probably we would get to uh, better results. Good. Uh, result was that almost all of the changes were detected on artificial surfaces because as i already mentioned uh, the solution is supposed or was supposed to be used only in protected areas of critical infrastructure so somewhere where you can expect natural surfaces so we will uh, move uh, quickly to uh, introduction of the second use case which was focusing on detection of flooding, to be more specific uh, to, for a detection of open water flooding in uh, non-urban environments. The solution is using a combination of statistical change detection, pretty similar to the one uh, introduced uh, for the first use case, but with the different settings applied and also detection of open uh, water uh, which is which has a very specific signature on rather data there are uh, again some several post-processing steps applied uh, one interesting information mainly maybe for uh, all of you who are interested in using greater data for flood detection and uh, the our solution is using images from both data polarizations and if any area uh, is going to be said that it's flooded it must be change detected in both polarization and also open water detected uh, in both polarization so only the combination of all these four situations lead to a final results of flooding Uh, so again, uh, to validate uh, the solution, we have chosen five flood events within uh, different European countries in the last few years. We have processed uh, not only the data for the specific flood events, but for uh, longer time periods, like half a year, to see if there are false positive alarms uh, occurring. So it means if the solution is detecting the flooding, although it was no flooding occurring in reality. And to, again, to uh, summarize somehow the results, uh, we can say that four of the five flood events were detected successfully. The only one which was not detected successfully was a flash flood occurring uh, in, near Unity of City in the Czech Republic and the developed solution uh, typically provided or is providing flooded pollutants which are a bit smaller than those derived from a reference uh, individual independent reference data sets the main reason of this weakness of our product is given by the universal sensitivity parameter settings which is applied in the processing of all uh, locations so it means that you don't have to take the solution and tune the parameters for specific areas for specific uh, events it's just one universal settings which can be applied anywhere anytime and it uh, ensures uh, successful suppression of false alarms you get a very very small number of false alarms in any area which we have tested so there is a paper published uh, on this solution uh, which is describing it in, in detail and also all the validation results so if this topic interests you you might be also interested in that publication and in our limited time we are forced to move on and to say something about the 
interferometric solution, which was uh, developed for uh, vertical displacements monitoring over uh, technical infrastructure. So we have implemented pers persistent scatterer uh, solution, PS solution. Uh, for the PS processing, we are using open source software called uh, Salsit. And on the inputs, the user only has to specify the area of interest and the timeline of his interest. And there are also some optional inputs which uh, might be provided if the user uh, wants to do it. Uh, so the workflow of the algorithm is uh, following after the data selection and its download. There is some standard pre-processing applied and then uh, the own PS processing. And in the post-processing steps, uh, for example, spatial merge of results from individual tracks is being done or a detection of uh, anomaly points, so of PS points, which behave anomaly uh, compared to their previous uh, behavior. Uh, for the validation, we have realized uh, two sets of uh, works. In the first one, we have established uh, a testing polygon uh, within the campus of our university. It's uh, consisting of uh, three corner reflectors plus uh, two GNSS stations for an independent evaluation of uh, in some re results. And the most important uh, thing here is that one of the corner reflectors together with the GNSS antenna, uh, antenna of GNSS receiver, were installed on a construction which allowed us a repetitive slow movements. So what we were doing was that once per month, we lifted the construction up with uh, the size of 2.5 millimeters. So this is that blue uh, line uh, in the figure in the right part of the screen where you can see rapid changes of the height uh, once per month. So in total, after one year of this kind of activity, we have realized movement of three centimeters and we were trying to uh, compare with the reality, the outputs of the INSR processing from two tracks. Those are these red and black stars uh, in the figure, and also with the GNSS uh, data uh, results. And we can say, or we can conclude that the developed solution in this case reached a millimetric level of, uh, of accuracy of the rate uh, estimate. We have uh, more results for it, but uh, because of time, I'm not able to uh, show to you everything. If you're again, again interested in this kind of uh, stuff, you can uh, take a look on the paper, which is being referenced at this uh, slide. So uh, I am getting to uh, tell you something about the last validation works. Uh, in this case, we were focusing on displacement monitoring over underground uh, gas storage. We have selected uh, infrastructure in Tvrdonice within the Czech Republic. We have again installed there uh, a GNSS permanent station. And over the area of uh, gas storage, uh, there is a working cycle where you inject uh, the gas uh, underground during a non-heating season and you take the gas outside you withdraw it during the heating season and uh, with this working cycle there is or there are changes in the terrain height and some movement can happen which also which can be detected uh, with techniques uh, as INSR as well as uh, GNSS. So uh, to show you at least one example of the results, uh, you can see here uh, displacements uh, derived from GNSS data. These are these uh, orange points. And from the INSR processing, these are these blue points. 
and you can clearly see here a periodic behavior uh, with a period of approximately one year when the terrain is not moving only up and down with the amplitude of approximately one centimeters, but in the east-west direction, east-west component of the displacement is shown in the bottom part of the figure. Okay, to conclude, uh, uh, within the ESA-funded project, we have uh, developed uh, automatic processing change for Sentinel-1 imagery for four use cases. All the developed solutions were uh, validated against independent uh, reference uh, data sets. Two of uh, the processing change, one for the flood detection and the uh, pass insert solution were implemented in the set side platform, which was developed within the project by CGI IT company. And there will be a next presentation given by Wojciech Ron from this company, who will tell more about this, about their works. So you are welcome to see it. And that's all from my side. Uh, I want to thank you for your uh, attention. If there are any questions, I would be happy to, to answer them. Thanks a lot. Uh, Michal for interesting presentation. Let's check uh, whether there are any questions in the, in uh, the chat. So there is apparently, uh, yeah, there is okay. Just just to ask questions. So there is no no. Okay. So there is any questions here? Question here in the room. Don't hesitate to ask. If you have any question, okay. So no. So thanks. Thanks a lot. You are welcome. Don't hesitate to contact me anytime if you are just interested in anything what was presented. Okay, great. So I will introduce Wojciech uh, uh, Rom, who will be continuing in uh, in uh, Sentinel One uh, topic. Uh, his presentation is uh, called stability monitoring based on Copernicus Sentinel-1 data. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. So good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm glad that I can be here and uh, it's really good uh, to continue after Mr. Kachmaji because my presentation is, uh, let's say, continuing with the topic which was introduced by the previous speaker. And uh, I would like to tell you uh, about the project that was mentioned in the presentation, uh, in the previous presentation. And it, was, it is because uh, it was done uh, between our company, CGI, where I work, and uh, between Technical University of Ostrava. So maybe for the beginning, uh, I'm quite used to uh, challenge uh, the situation that people uh, doesn't know my company. So firstly, I just shortly tell you that uh, CGI is quite big uh, IT company operating worldwide and it has many uh, offices uh, in Europe, especially in West European countries and here in Czech Republic uh, also uh, has three offices in Prague no, and Ostrava and also one in Bratislava and in Budapest. Uh, as you can see, approximately 800, I'd say, IT uh, gurus and guys are working in, uh, in Prague mostly and in Brno. And we are doing projects for not just public sector, but also for another private companies uh, and uh, not typically for end users. So that's the reason why the people usually uh, don't know about uh, our company because we are not usually providing services to end users. In my team, even if we are big corporate, even if we have many offices in Europe, so here in Prague, we have approximately around 20 people. Most of them work in Holeshovice district, where is the location of USPA, uh, European Agency for the Space Program, and they are focusing on public regulated services, so services which are typically used by special entities, which has access to coding services provided by European navigation system. And in my part of team, which is like five people on the other side of the screen, 
uh, we are doing our observation projects, uh, which are uh, using Copernicus data sets, and uh, they are usually supported by ESA funds. And as the Mr. Kaczmarzyk uh, told you a few minutes ago, uh, we had a project which uh, ended at the end of the last year, uh, quite complicated name, Earth Observation Automated Monitoring Open Platform, but uh, the solution or the aim of the project was to develop a cloud-based platform to process uh, satellite images, mostly fully automatically, and to evaluate them and uh, detect, uh, let's say, changes which happened uh, during the time of interest. And we are cooperating with the Technical University of Ostrava, uh, and their responsibility was uh, to develop for use cases which were, uh, let's say, quite in detail introduced by Mr. Kachmazi. Uh, on our side, during that project, uh, which took uh, two years, uh, we decided to implement two of them, flood detection and displacement detection. And the reason was that we evaluated these use cases as the most valuable for potential users and customers. And uh, what is good to say that because we were cooperating with the university, the results uh, are, let's say, full of details about the data which were used, so Sentinel-1, and they are full of uh, many statistical metrics, uh, which are typically for a long temporal series analysis. So these data are sometimes really hard to interpret for users which are not involved in, in geospatial data processing, or they are, let's say, not uh, fully, um, or they are not typically used to, uh, let's say, evaluate, uh, Earth observation analysis. So for, for that reason, I will skip this uh, slide because it's introducing the technique uh, for the displacement detection, but it was mentioned a few minutes ago. So from, for that reason, we decided to, uh, because uh, it was uh, not possible to do it in the, in the original project for extra money from different funds, and to build a special web application, which is using the results from displacement detection for, let's say, insurance sector. And why insurance? Because USPA uh, presented in their market report at the end of the last year that insurance and finance are the sectors which will grow as the fastest in the following 10 years. And they will use uh, much, much more, uh, let's say, spatial uh, products and uh, earth observation products uh, in following years. So during that project, we want to develop a web front, web front end application, uh, which is easy to use even for people which are, let's say, completely out of geospatial world. And if, if it's possible to deliver them quite complicated products from the displacement detection analysis in the simplest form, uh, in the form uh, which is easy to understand to them and uh, in the form which uh, everyone can understand quite easily. So we built that uh, solution on uh, mostly, or especially just on free open source uh, technologies as PostgreSQL, PostGIS, GeoServer, and so on. So I will show you, I hope I will have a few minutes at the end of the presentation, uh, the application and uh, that's how it looks. It's simple uh, web application with map window, which is in your full screen mode, and you can easily navigate through different parts of the city, for example, and you will see in colors different, uh, different uh, evaluation of stability, which is uh, based on persistent scatterers, which, was, which were introduced by Mr. Kachmanik in the previous presentation. Uh, for those who are interested in technology, so the architecture design uh, is composed from two parts, front end and back end, and it's a fully uh, cloud based solution. So we are using uh, Microsoft Azure as a cloud service. Uh, on top of that, uh, we are using uh, container orchestration system, Kubernetes, with Docker containers. Uh, which are isolating applications which are running uh, fully independently so they can be replaced, updated, uh, let's say, 
uh, smoothly and uh, we can be sure that we will not break the, the application or the whole solution uh, if we do some small changes. So this is quite typical uh, microservices solution and uh, the front-end application is based on uh, JavaScript and two libraries, React and Leaflet, to uh, visualize the results uh, in the map window and in the browser. And we are using Keycloak as um, uh, identity and access management uh, solution, which is ready to use. So it's just necessary to set up everything correctly and you can, uh, you can secure your solution. And for example, uh, propose different customers, uh, uh, let's say different login uh, settings, uh, roles, and uh, access to your data. So good to mention. And uh, I would like to say that we are not just uh, uh, build the solution on Sentinel-1 data uh, on the displacement detection analysis, but we are also using another uh, third-party services which are free to use. Here in Czech Republic, uh, I'm speaking about, uh, let's say, services which are provided by uh, Czech Office for Surveying, Mapping, and Cadastre. So I'm speaking about Autophoto Maps, Cadastre Maps, and also some uh, quite high viable uh, service. It's a search geocoding service, which uh, you can use if you want to look for special addresses and their location uh, in the country. So combination of all of these services, we build a solution. And uh, of course, Sentinel-1 data have special um, resolution, like around five by 20 meters. So for, let's say, each building in ideal world, you can get one reflectance uh, for radar waves. But uh, also, not all the time the situation is perfect. So for some buildings, you will get more, uh, let's say, reflections, but for some, you will not get almost, uh, you will get one or even none. So it depends on the situation. So you cannot say in advance how many, uh, let's say, points and uh, time series observations you will have for, for some specific uh, location. But uh, it's good to say that if you are speaking about the insurance sector, what is typical for them and what is quite uh, good uh, for people to interpret the data is to combine them with something what they know really good. And that's typical colors from maps because uh, they are, let's say, related uh, to ownership rights and also to insurance uh, companies which are providing to users and owners, let's say, services to their properties. So we combine all of this information and create, uh, let's say, open post-processing algorithm for a time series in the form of points. We merge all of the data together. Uh, we created open evaluation metrics, uh, reclassify the data, and uh, combine them with the cadastral maps and to make them as easy to understand uh, as it is possible. Uh, all of the solution uh, is again to, uh, was implemented into our platform in the form of a special Docker container, which is based on QGIS and Python, uh, mostly by QGIS and GeoPython. And we are using also GDAL uh, to convert this data uh, to form and store it in PostgreSQL database with PostgreS extension. And after that, typical workflow, uh, publish them uh, via GeoServer uh, as uh, services. So the typical operation scenario for user is just login, search for desired locality, uh, for example, manually or by, by address, because we are using the job coding service, check the stability, check some additional informations if they are provided and export the results or they can be happy just to know what is uh, happening there or not. So I will show you short demonstration and I have to log in into the application. So give me a second. This is just demo. So 
Uh, we don't have so much data right now in the application for the demo uh, mode, but uh, for short uh, demo, it's enough. So at the beginning, after login, for each user, they are, let's say, specific locations, which are already evaluated and already calculated because uh, maybe it was not mentioned, but the processing of, of long temporary series uh, of Sentinel-1 data sets, uh, it, it takes usually days or weeks because we are speaking about terabytes of data, uh, of data sets. So if you will have the data, you will have to prepare them in advance so to enable the users to reach them just as results. So when I will go to some location, so right here, I have the Holeshovice district and I can go, let's say, just by simple navigation to some specific park. And here is quite new uh, shopping uh, mall. So after clicking on the map, because it's, uh, let's say a little bit uh, pink color here. So it's, uh, it should be something what is not so stable. So I will see that the stability value is around 80%. That's based on our classification, but most of the points which are composing that area or the reflectance information which we have from the displacement detection analysis are stable. So I can I can check it uh, not just by the color uh, of cadastral map, but of course I can also uh, switch to different modes. So I can go directly to persistent scatter points. I can also, for example, switch off the, the cadastral map and I will have, uh, uh, let's say the point layer, which is representing the reflectance. I will see, I can see that I have many green points which representing that nothing is happening there, but also some which are yellow or uh, let's say cayenne, which representing a uh, direction of movement up or down. But because we are speaking about points, it's not possible to say they are moving uh, up and down, uh, let's say horizontally or vertically, precisely because I have uh, measurement just in the line of sight of the radar and the reflector uh, on the ground. So if I will check some points which are yellow, I can see that they are really like uh, changing the distance uh, in the time series and they are farther and farther from the satellite during uh, uh, each observation. Which, which can be uh, expressed that the point is like going down typically. And if you will combine all the information which are here for the one building in one footprint of the building, you can say also if it's really like going down, how the movement is horizontal. And uh, it's typically to see it in the, in the polygon layer. Maybe I haven't mentioned that, but if I go here, I will see, you can see that the displacement direction is down. So by this, so let's say simple uh, check, uh, even like in the simple form or in like deep mode, if you can evaluate each point independently, you can evaluate the whole area and say, if it's something happening there, if uh, there is some potential risk, uh, for some insurance company or the owner that the building uh, can be, um, let's say, affected by some uh, by some accident, or it should be done something to to save the money of the owner of the building. For example, for another buildings, you can see that nothing is happening there, and uh, if some movement was detected, it's usually under one millimeter per year. That's let's say the the ratio, the precision of the method. So thank you for your attention. Uh, this was a short demo. Uh, if you have any questions, you are free to ask. Thank you. For, for, for nice presentation. So are there any questions here in the audience? What are the stories? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, the central data set doesn't contain this area, but we are right now working on the evaluation of the whole prior uh, for five years, like from 2017 to 2021. 
and uh, yeah, we will have the results, let's say, in, in one or two weeks. But typically what we have evaluated, most of the product is stable, just if some small parts are, are unstable and they are usually located close to the river. So, but I cannot say, or I cannot show you the results for that building where we are right now. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thank you. So let me introduce next speaker who is uh, Martin Landa. It's always uh, scary to introduce uh, yourself. So yeah, I'm scared. Then okay, so let's 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 uh, let's move to the next presentation. Yeah, it's prepared. Should be here. Okay, great. So, so I will be presenting uh, one of the outputs of Joe Harmonizer project, which is uh, called uh, presentation. Uh, will uh, will be presenting open open geospatial system for Lucas in situ data harmonization and distribution. I will be presenting our work on behalf uh, of the of the team which is behind. Uh, so, so I was working on this topic uh, together with uh, my colleagues, Lukasz Brodsky, Tomasz Wojciech, Andrzej Peszek, and Professor Lena Halonova from uh, from Department of Geomatics here at uh, the Faculty of Civil Engineering, Czech Technical University in Prague. So first of all, I would like to introduce you into Lucas' data datasets. Probably you know this dataset, but I let me let me just uh, in, just give you a brief introduction into the dataset. Uh, then in the second part, I will present our our uh, uh, our uh, result, uh, the system which is designed for fully automated uh, harmonization and distribution of Lucas data, which is the main point. And then at the end of the presentation, I, I will give you some conclusions. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, introduction. So what is Lucas uh, data set? Lucas uh, is, uh, stands for Land Use and Coverage Area Frame Survey. It's driven by uh, Eurostat. Uh, uh, all the data uh, and documentation is freely available on, uh, on uh, Eurostat web page. So you can, you can download it, you can use it for your work. Uh, the, the activity started uh, around to the year 2000 with the main goal to identify changes uh, in land cover and land use in Europe or better to say uh, on the territory of the U European Union. Uh, such information can be used in different fields uh, like a na nature protection, uh, soil protection, uh, monitoring of climate changes, monitoring of biodiversity, and so on. So that there, there can be plenty of users uh, which would use this data, data set for their work and for their research. Uh, uh, the institute, this is important thing, it's institute survey which uh, which is organized every three years. So it means that uh, uh, currently there are five uh, five uh, uh, series of observations. Uh, the next survey is planned for this year, so it's slightly delayed. And what is important, Lucas is 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 a real uh, is a real and unique ground truth data set so you can use it for for example for for uh, land products validation which is an important point uh, about the sampling 
density sampling density is defined by a uh, Lucas grade. So your stuff is coming with a grade, which is two times uh, two times kilometer uh, density. So it means that it has approximately more than one million of points. And every three years, uh, your stuff selects a subset of these points to be uh, observed. Uh, here in this table, you can see the, how, I mean, uh, how the number of points involved uh, evolved. Uh, the last the survey, which has been done in 2018, there were more than uh, 300,000 points as uh, observed uh, from 2028 EU countries. Uh, in overall, in the data set, currently there is uh, approximately one, uh, one, uh, one million three, uh, three hundred thousand points. So if you download the whole data set, all, all files which are provided by uh, your stuff, you will get this number. And I mean, for each, each point, there is a uh, 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 measured GPS uh, coordinate and theoretical. Of course, not every point is possible to visit. So there is a, there is a rule, I mean, that uh, in the case that, that, uh, that the point cannot be reached in 30 minutes, walking distance from the car, then it's processed in the office. Okay, so uh, what kind of information you can you can find in uh, Lucas data set? So the main goal is to to evaluate land and land uh, land cover and land use classes. Lucas is using their own nomenclature. It's hierarchical, so there are like three three le levels. On level three, there is uh, 76 classes and 40, uh, seven, sorry, 76 land cover classes and 41 land use classes. Uh, the surveyors uh, are collecting different uh, different information, including photos. So for each point, they 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 take uh, they are taking the five photos, one facing photo, and four photos in uh, cardinal direction northeast west south and so on uh for one of 10 points uh, they also take a uh, 500 gram top soil sample uh you can also see that i mean the data set of course uh, i mean if you compare uh uh each year the the number of attributes which which are collected uh changed uh the number is is uh, increasing uh, in in the last uh, survey 2018 for each point there there were almost 100 attributes collected uh including the extension which which were introduced in 2018 uh regarding uh, copernicus uh inspire and iunes uh Okay, so let's continue with with the with the next slide. So, as I already mentioned, that I mean the the the, the data set uh, is changing over the time. So the number of attributes is changing. Uh, so you can easily see that that uh, the data set has its own evolution. Uh, it's not only about adding new attributes, but there are different kind of changes. Some attributes were removed. Uh, for example, uh, here in 2018, the, the transact uh, attribute has been removed, so it's not collected anymore. Uh, some attributes were renamed. And what is the mo most important, uh, some, some attributes were, were, were affected by different coding. So it means that if you, if you take the attribute from 2015 and you compare the coding with uh, with uh, with 2018 uh, 2018 uh, survey uh, you will discover that the coding is different and it means for example here's example 
uh, relate, uh, which is demonstrating the land cover classes that even even land cover classes change. Uh, the changes can be related to continuous and categorical uh, variables and so on. So it means that if you want to use this data set for change analysis, you need to perform some steps. You need to harmonize values to the reference year. So you, you pick up a reference year like 2018, and you need to perform uh, steps to, I mean, to modify uh, var variables from uh, previous survey years to, 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 be, to, be, uh, to be synchronized with uh, reference year. So it's not analyzed ready data set, I mean, if you, if you download uh, the original uh, original uh, files from or primary files from your start web page. So here's information about, I mean, how, how the data are distributed. So they're distributed as a plain CSV files. Here is example for, for single single point, single observation in 2018 and 2000. So 2006 and 2018. So finally, let me let me uh, introduce or let me uh, uh, step into the second part of the presentation where I would like to uh, present uh, our work. So so we at the beginning we set up important goals what we would like to aim. So we would the first step or first goal was that we would like to provide harmonized and also space-time aggregated robust data. So it means that space-time aggregated means that for, for a repeated survey, uh, we have just a single report in, uh, in the data set. Uh, we wanted to provide or to design the harmonization process in fully automated way and configurable by an extensible way. So, so uh, basically uh, uh, you can change the harmonization rules and you can get a slightly different result. And extens extensible, this is important because of the new surveys which will, which will come. So we, would, we want it to be prepared. Uh, we believe that open data should be, should be provided uh, through standardized uh, channels. So we, we focus on OGC specification uh, that we wanted to provide da data in, in this manner. Uh, we also wanted to build a set, set of tools which, which uh, enables a wider our audience to access Lucas data. So not only provide data, but also give uh, uh, give some uh, useful tools to the users to access Lucas da data. So we, we focus on Python uh, programming uh, language and on QGIS pl platform. I will just, uh, I will be speaking about that later. Yeah, and we also wanted to introduce some additional functionality related to that. For example, to to provide uh, land cover nomenclature. Also, I mean uh, that you, could, you can you can translate uh, Lucas nomenclature to Corina and so on, which I mean, which is also an important point. So based based on the calls, uh, we we defined objectives and we we designed our system. So it's let's say fully automated in the, in the sense that there is a system deployment package which deploys the whole system on your machine on your server so you can you can provide you can provide this uh, service on on your on your hardware uh it's it means it's fully automated in the sense that there are docker uh, containers uh and you basically run one command docker compose and it will just uh, run and deploy it will take some time of course because the System need to download the primary data, apply all harmonization step, and then to set up the web service, which can be consumed by the clients, like a Python package or QGIS 
plugin. So here's here's example. Those of you who are following the the uh, the training session, you may be you are more familiar. Uh, so basically, when you want to when you want to use Python API, you are geospatial developer or data scientist, and you are, for example, used to use uh, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, you can use our Python API. You define request, and based on this request, you will get a subset of harmonized Lucas data. In this case, we are asking or we are querying points which are located in Czech Republic and, uh, and uh, Slovakia uh, for years 2018, uh, sorry, 2015 and 2018. And uh, we are also applying the thematic uh, filter, uh, which uh, returns only subset of attributes which are related to land power and land use uh, thema, thema um, topic, let's say. So you are not getting 100 uh, attributes, but a uh, slightly uh, smaller number of attributes. Here is a similar similar request. We are just enabling uh, space-time aggregation. So you are getting you are getting space-time aggregated data. So it means that that for 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 the for the point which was uh, visited repeatedly, you are getting just one one report, and you are getting for each each year uh, separated sets of uh, attributes. So here's, for example, I mean the, on on the picture on the right side, you can see the the, the, the points are uh, symbolized by by the number of visits. So you can you can see uh, you can see the for example the points which were was it only once or more, more times? Yeah, uh, uh, I have prepared a QGIS plugin uh, demonstration, but I will run it uh, afterwards because I mean, time is running. So I will just keep it running uh, when I will be trying to answer your questions. So there is a QGIS plugin. It's easy to be installed. You just you it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, um, available through QGIS repository. So you you can install it normally as other pl plugins you are used to. You just need to enable experimental modules because the, the plugin is still. We decided to mark it as experimental because I mean we just released it a few weeks ago. You can also browse. Photos, which which are which are pro provided uh, by uh, your staff. Uh, so this is, I mean, additional feature. You can also access photos through Python API, of course. So conclusion. So uh, what we wanted to to uh, uh, reach. I hope that we were successful. So. We are able now to provide harmonized and space-time aggregated Luca, Lucas data set, which should be analyzed ready. Uh, the system is running online, so we are also running a dem demonstration uh, ser service, which is provided, oh, which is available, sorry, at this address. So you can follow us here. Uh, we are, of course, improving it, and we are still working on that. So. So, and we are looking forward for, uh, I mean, uh, the next uh, Lucas uh, survey this year that we will be able to extend it. Uh, the whole system is released as a open source. So there's, there's a GitLab uh, repositories for each component, the system deployment package, uh, the Python package and the QJS plugin. So we can follow us there. You can you can fill, sorry, you can, we can report issues and so on. We will be uh, happy to see that uh, there are users. Uh, okay, so there are, there's a link to the tra training session, which was part of this workshop. And the, la the last slide is the, is the demonstration of QGIS plugin. So I will just uh, start it and uh thanks for for attention
and uh, I am looking forward to answer your questions if there will be any. Thanks. Yeah, there were some questions in training se session already. So, so uh, yeah, please don't. How many uh, downloads do you have? We are not tracking uh, statistics. No, no, no. And uh, I mean, anything, I mean, we, else? we finished this work like a few weeks ago. Okay. We are now finishing the review process on of scientific uh, publication. So it's, it was not promoted. Basically, this this work, workshop is the first one. Uh, where they, and they contacted the uh, people that uh, made the contained Lucas to tell them that you made this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are going. We are just waiting for the scientific publication. That I mean, we. We finished the review process. Now we are just uh, facing two minor uh, revisions. Uh, so it should be, it should be. I mean, the paper should be should be out like in a few weeks, one two weeks, and then 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 of course we we are going to promote it. And uh, so that's that's plan for of course to to promote our work. Yeah. What parameters can we use to change in the harmonization? Uh, what uh, parameters? parameters in the, in the yeah, harmonization. basically, uh, the the harmonization process is dri driven by uh, CSV files. Okay, now we are in the harmonization process. We are combining CSV files. For example, that you want to rename rename one at the to another. Uh, so so one part uh, of the harmonization process is driven by CSV file. There's, there, there's a Python code behind which applies the changes. And one part is uh, driven by SQL statements. And we would like to change it to that. I mean, it will be only CSV files. So basically, you will change the CSV file. And there's, of course, also the, the con configuration when you set up the system it's uh, driven by JSON file. So maybe you, you can also specify that you want to process not every year, you want to harmonize on the last two years and so on. So it's a mixture of JSON file, CSV file and SQL statement, but I, I hope that we will just transfer the SQL statements into the CSV files that it will be let's say more gen generate and more easy for user to change the parameters. Okay. So yeah. So I will prepare the last uh, presentation, right? It's uh, here in no online. Okay. So let me introduce the last speaker, uh, Stefan Blumentrat, who will be uh, presenting uh, processing climate and satellite data with GRASS GIS 8. So Stefan, can, can you hear, hear us? It's a pleasure to see you. Yeah, uh, here well, do you have the sound for me too? Yeah, we just need to, yeah. Can you hear us? Yes. Great. So the floor is yours. Okay. Virtually. Let's see that we get started here. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> so thanks for the opportunity to, to present how climate and satellite data can be processed with GRASS GIS and how it is processed in, in NINA and uh, some recent developments for some new uh, possibilities there. Before I get into the technical details, a bit about the background that I think is important to uh, to know. So Nina is uh, Norwegian's uh, leading research institute in applied ecology. We we're established as a research foundation um, in 1988, and we have now like about uh, 300 employees in total and offices all across Norway. So we, we do mainly research and assessments in applied ecology and, and also social sciences. 
uh, we do some environmental long-term monitoring, counseling and evaluation of uh, policies, uh, a lot of uh, work we're doing for uh, government agencies. Um, we do also some scientific and practical counseling of uh, ongoing conservation programs. Um, and of course, try to get uh, the knowledge that we develop out to the general public. Um, we're working quite internationally, as you can see on the map, but especially across uh, country borders towards uh, Sweden and Finland, especially since the Finno Scandian Peninsula is kind of uh, yeah, a natural unit and uh, the species that we work with, they don't care about political borders. So for us, like working internationally and across borders is quite, quite natural. So um, why do we actually work with climate data? Uh, climate data is actually quite uh, fundamental for us, both in when we do long-term monitoring or GPS tracking data to, to study uh, animal movement and, and effects of climate and so on, then we need to have a climate data and climate is actually one of the most fundamental factors um, that govern species distribution and ecological processes, both in water and on land. So, um, so uh, climate data is, is quite important to us and we need to have a good understanding how climate affects the current uh, state of nature uh, in order to be able to, for example, predict how climate change will, will affect future habitats or what kind of uh, conservation measures are meaningful with regards to climate, for example. Luckily, there is an increasing amount of climate data available, both in the form of a model climate data, as well as satellite-based climate data. So uh, also the awareness of data quality becomes increasingly important when, when working with climate data in uh, nature research. Um, as mentioned, there is, a, there is plenty of data available. Uh, here is an overview of some of the data that I will touch on uh, during the presentation. Uh, modeled climate data, there is of course the most well-known, I guess, World Klim and Shelsa data like on a global scale. For Norway, we have uh, also daily climate data since 1959 in a gridded uh, square kilometer format uh, that is provided through uh, in form of net CDF uh, format. Uh, recently also um, Nordic uh, gridded climate data has been added that covers all goes also across the country borders. And of course, um, there are increasing amount of satellites that also can provide very useful climate information, not only a form of temperature, but all kinds of different climate climate variables. One like more comprehensive data set that was developed by Fondation Edmund Mach um, is the URLST data set that also already has some sort of newer versions, but that is something that we have been looking on. Um, MODIS, of course, maybe the most well-known, Sentinel-3 came with a New data, and then there is a probably less well-known GCOM-C uh, satellite from uh, the Japanese space agency. And for us in Norway, these satellites, they have a like relatively high revisiting, especially the polar orbiting satellites have a high revisiting frequency, so we can get quite often updates. Um, however, we have uh, challenges regarding like large latitudinal and altitudinal range in the in the country. Um, but sort of the question that we were faced with is like, what is the best climate data for us to use or the most appropriate, that's probably the better term. Um, and on the images on the right hand side, you can see up here is um, the modeled climate data over, this is the, the white area is the Oslo Fjord, that you can see this is um, the, the square kilometer modeled climate data. And you can see that there is like, you, you can imagine some valleys, but not uh, very high detail. Um, the URLST data set with 250 meter resolution uh, provides quite more like variation. And the, you see the city uh, becomes more and more clearly visible. And if we just pick a single day, um, and high more high, even more high resolu resolution Landsat data, where we computed land surface temperature from or using a GrassGIS module for that. 
um, then you can see even high detail, high degree of detail. So in, in general, uh, there is a lot of potential, but uh, as you can see on the right hand side, there is uh, quite a few clouds or there can be quite a few clouds in Norway. So these are like challenges when it comes to using satellite imagery for climate data. Um, but in a landscape with such a complex terrain like Norway, resolution actually has quite some impact. Um, as you can see in the in the image here, um, this is just sort of a statistics about the variation of um, temperature within the square kilometer grid of the Sinorga data set, uh, the variation of the ULST data. And you can see here where there is a like high um, so degree of altitudinal changes on, on local scale within one square kilometer a grid cell, you can find quite high differences uh, in terms of temperature. Um, and if we just simply compare the two data sets by subtracting them from each other, you can also see that there is are significant differences and also quite clear patterns. Um, so what we did was like looking at um, some of the temperature loggers that some of my colleagues have uh, floating around in the landscape and especially in the mountains in Norway and looking at which data set is actually sort of more accurate. Uh, for our um, monitoring uh, locations. And we find that there is like a larger deviation in this modis derived URLST data set compared to the Sinoga data. However, uh, the URLST data set correlates quite a bit better um, or a bit better than, um, than the Sinoga data. So it's like, not like a clear cut answer, like which kind of data source is more more accurate uh, and it depends quite a bit on terrain and land cover and seasonal changes. Um, so if you see down here, you can see uh, for the URLST data set, the average deviation from the temperature logger uh, measurements that we have in situ um, and then the correlation that also varies quite a bit across the year. Um, so the, the next question was like, what, how does these differences, how do they affect actually um, what we predict in terms of um, possible effects on, on nature? And the, uh, just like two, two examples of an invasive species, the, the Spanish slug here you see um, in, in blue, where both like, if we compute species distribution models based on just two different variables, so these two different climate data sets, the URST and the Sinorga data, where it's green, both data sets come to the same um, conclusion with regards to habitat suitability, while the purple areas, their URLST says like here is a suitable habitat, while uh, Sinorga data does not provide that uh, prediction and the yellow is the other way around. So there are like really significant differences. So it's important to, to be aware. So, but now let's get more into the sort of technical issues of the, of the presentation, because like, if we want to work more seriously with, with climate data, um, do that with a grass GIS. And the reason or we use grass GIS for, for that kind of things is that um, grass GIS is quite suitable as a kind of a data warehouse where we can store let's say analysis ready data um, that can be shared across uh, across the organization and make the data available to, to all colleagues that, that, that work in Nina. Um, so, and GRASS is suitable for that because it has this kind of uh, built-in data warehouse functionality thanks to its uh, multi-user database concept. Um, it's quite interoperable. So a lot of colleagues work with R, they can easily connect to GRASS.js and and make use of the data that is stored in, in GRASS.js. Um, but it can also be linked to PostGIS, used with Python, QGIS, and sensor observation service is also one that's included. Um, so it's, um, it's, it guarantees a high degree of accessibility with different levels of technical skills. So if you're like, able to do some programming, then you can sort of interact more deeply. But also, if you're not like a real technician, you can make use of the data that is stored there. And of course, uh, GRASS.js comes with lots of uh, functionality, especially for temporal 
uh, spatial temporal data nowadays often called data cubes um, it's very efficient and uh, is in a way uh, our reliable number cruncher for spatial analysis so um, but how can you process then climate data in GRASS-GIS uh, as mentioned, uh, Nordic grid uh, climate data comes in a net CDF CF format. Um, and uh, until very recently, there were no like real direct linkages of uh, this, this data format uh, towards uh, the grass spatial temporal, temporal concept. Um, so that is something that we have been working on. Um, so you see here the data from the NC, NGCD. It's provided uh, through threads, which is kind of a server solution for NetCDF data that forms the that follows this climate um, forecast convention. Um, and we we develop two two modules. One is uh, just a simple sort of uh, crawler that you can go through all the data and can collect all the single data sets that are part of. Uh, this hierarchical network, uh, uh, hierarchical storage of um, of the climate data, where you see it's like stored by year and then by by month and then by day. So you can like collect all the URLs to all the data sets with mcrawl threads, um, and then um, you can import the data directly into GRASS-GIS and get the space time raster data set or a data cube. Um, from that, and uh, that uh, solution now supports the new concept in GRASS 8 with uh, semantic labels, also known as band references. So we can have different climate variables as different sort of uh, as a, that can get different semantic labels within the sp same space-time raster data set. It supports uh, reprojecting and subsetting, and you can also just instead of downloading the data all to your local uh, hard drive, you can just link link stuff. Um, so yeah, you list it, you list the data, and then you import them with the uh, uh, TRUST import net CDF. Um, in a way, this this uh, this import is comparable to the GDAL cubes R package, uh, which also uses uh, quite a bit uh, the virtual raster format. Um, so net CDF CF uh, format is kind of the de facto standard of uh, meteorological data. So now uh, with these tools, you can uh, easily and directly get them into your GRASS GIS uh, database. And uh, it's not only the Norwegian Meteorological Institute using it, but there are a couple of other uh, like uh, thread servers that you can um, scroll through and, and crawl through like, like this and harvest data, um, terabytes of it actually. Um, one thing that's special for Norway is that also Sentinel-2 data, and now there's also Sentinel-1, is provided in form of net CDF CF format because the Meteorological Institute is running the Norwegian ground segment. So um, they provide this data, um, and we use uh, Sentinel-2, the specific Norwegian format of uh, Sentinel-2 data that is processed with a Norwegian terrain model. Um, to stress test the solution a bit. So there are like 700, roughly 700,000 um, maps, 21 bands per scene across five UTM zones um, that we have been starting to, to import into, into GRASS-GIS to have like linkages. You can see here uh, the start of the data cube that is built. Um, there are some issues with the, with the parallelism though, because the threat server has some uh, faced some issues with like data sets not closing properly. So, um, but the, the ground segment is looking into that. It's not the client side, but the server side issue. Um, examples for how to run all this are in the in the manual of the of the add-ons for GRASS-GIS. And um, I'm planning to to upload the ground segment uh, map set as soon as that is done to Synodo. Um, for Sentinel-3, there were neither any specific import tools available in GRASS-GIS. That was another point of work that we've been, been working on. Sentinel-3 data 
uh, comes in different forms and layouts depending on the on the product. Um, our starting point has been LST. Um, the thing is that the data is not sort of comes not in form of a regular grid but irregular grid. So so we implemented the import of Sentinel three data um, in form of pixel as points import. So you can see in a way the the pattern down here that indicates a bit sort of the uh, irregular irregular placement, but there is like not um, a hundred percent covering data set as a result. Um, so there needs the data needs to be um, interpolated at the end. Um, here is like in general the workflow. Uh, like you download the Sentinel three data to your local hard drive. Um, and then you can import them and, and on import you get um, a file that sort of collects some of the metadata that you can use to build the data queue for Sentinel-3 data. Um, and the last satellite that we've been working on is the GCOMC. That's in a way a bit similar to, to Sentinel-3, um, comparable both in terms of um, features and formats. Um, it, it also has an open uh, open data license model, so it's like freely available for everybody. Um, also here, the format and the layout of the files depend a bit on the product. Uh, so it's like not one import uh, solution possible for all, all data products of that satellite. Um, yeah, and the data is actually made available through the G portal, which uh, provides an FTP protocol for downloading. And um, we are working on some, some add-ons to like also get the, the GCOMC and other data from YAXA, the, the Japanese space agency into, into GRASS-GS. Um, so the, the process is the same as with, uh, with Sentinel-3, you download the data and then um, you import it into the GRASS-GS database. The download can even be, be done parallel, the import is parallelized. Um, then you create this the space-time data cube. Um, from that. And once you have all those data in, inside your GRASS-GS um, GRASS location uh, or your map set, then you can start working with the data. Uh, tools that we regularly use for analyzing space-time data sets and satellite and, and uh, climate data in GRASS-GS is, for example, tirast what um, that we use to connect ecological um, monitoring locations with spatial temporal data. So, so we get a time series for the particular points where my colleagues are out in the field and collecting data, ecological data. Uh, the colleagues that use uh, the GPS tracking, for them there is a module named V what STRDS timestamp that uses sort of the time temporal information in the GPS collar to, to sample um, the space-time data set across uh, the temporal and spatial domain. Uh, BioClim is one of like the, the daily data that we get are usually not very use usable directly in um, ecological analysis, um, but the BioClim are like very popular and well-known variables that sort of um, are ecologically more meaningful than the daily temperatures themselves. Um, TRAST aggregate is another module to just um, yeah, compute different ag aggregate statistics, maps that aggregate the daily data, like monthly temperature average, uh, yearly, and so on. Um, TRAST map calc allows you to run some, some simpler spatial temporal map calculator expressions uh, can be used, for example, to, to compute uh, the number of days or the days with a temperature, zero temperature crossing. So when, when um, it's freezing and then thawing again. Um, for a little, little bit more complex uh, spatial temporal algebra, there is a TRAST algebra um, that for example, can be used to compute the first and last day of snow cover uh, per hydrological year um, using those temperature um, climate data. 
our seasons to compute uh, the different seasons from, for example, NDVI data and um, aggregations um, in terms of univariate statistics with TRAS. So there is uh, plenty of uh, possibilities in GraphJS to, to, to analyze those data once you have it. So I think we are almost up with the time. Um, so um, in general, satellite derived temperature or climate data, they have a significant application potential in nature research, but there are some, some challenges. Um, they are in that sense rather a supplement than a replacement of our model climate data. And we may have to think about clever combinations of sensors and model data to get really, really accurate uh, climate data. And the, the solutions that I presented, they are mostly work in progress. So testing is welcome. Um, if anyone <clears throat> is interested uh, and to hear also more, please feel free to contact me for, uh, for questions. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Stefan, for, for very interesting presentation. I will just check the uh, chat where are, there are no, no questions. So please here in the room, feel free to ask.